Fantastic. Well, uh, good evening here, people in Vancouver. Uh, good morning in other parts of the world. Oh, there's a, there a follow-up here? Let me just disconnect from this. Can you guys hear a, an echo like my uh, like I am? No. No. I'm hearing an echo in my ears, so I'm gonna I'm gonna that's technology for you. One sec. Is that better? Can you hear me? Sure. Well, Amanda joined us too. Thank you, Amanda, for joining us. Melanie and Patricia. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, Amanda joined us too. Sorry, Thank I'm getting Amanda some echoes again. Us. Melanie and Patricia. Can you guys hear that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Amanda oh, joined us too. Sorry, I'm getting some echoes again. Melanie and Let me just stop that. that? Sorry, guys. Fantastic. I don't know what's going on. Sorry, I'm getting some echoes again. Let me just start. Well, good. Uh, well, again, welcome, everyone. Sorry about that technical difficulty. Uh, it's unpredictable, this computer world and internet world. So here we go again. Uh, before we start on our topic, which is how to build resilience to uh, fear, how to neuropath reset our fears and anxiety. Uh, I have a little poll that I created here. If you can just take a couple minutes here to look through it. Can you see it? Yeah. If you can fill that up. That'll be very helpful to what we're gonna do today. So the first question is, what symptoms do your fears exhibit or anxieties? Are you experiencing any back pain, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, neck pain, digestive problems, fatigue, or other? Um, if you can fill that up, that'll be great. And then uh, what are the consequences of your fear? That's the second question. Are you experiencing any chronic pain possibly because of it? Any disease or condition? Any isolation, depression, self-sabotage? Or do you find compromise in yourself in any way? So those are things that you can, uh, yeah, yeah, take take notes off and uh, and just pointers for yourself really. And also understanding how committed you are to your fears. Are you highly, uh, to working with your fears, are you highly committed? Is there a low commitment or you're just not ready? Good, everybody's good with that? Yeah, what is forming? Four. Which one? Number four, untitled question. Oh, there's no, there's no question there. Sorry. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. So anybody would like to share anything that they notice for themselves? Whoops, so I, see some, I see some neck pain, fatigue coming up back pain. Yes, we are compromising ourselves and other. Anybody wants to specify what the other means? You don't have to. No, okay. So those are some of the symptoms of fear. There's lots, lots others, but, but those are some. So let's start with that. 
uh, you know, I call them fears with evidence. Fears always provide evidence. And the evidence oftentimes of physical symptoms, you know, because fear uh, creates a lot of chronic patterns, chronic stresses in the mind and the body. If you find yourself uh, in your life resisting change, that's of course is fear. If you find yourself having blind spots, repeating things over and over again, or finding yourself in the same situations, that's a symptom of fear. If you find yourself caught in negative thought patterns, if you find yourself caught in darkness or depression, isolation, those are symptoms of fear. And that's what I call fears with evidence. I wanted to show you a few graphs to identify today also in what state, fear creates a state of operation. So here I have a graph, I'll just print it up for you. Hmm. That's also not coming up for me. Let's try that. Sorry, guys. Uh, why is it not working? Try that. No. Anyways, uh, I know this inside out, so I don't need a graph for you guys. Uh, when you under the rest, what do you find yourself falling into or defaulting into? Uh, running away, trying to fight the situation, or a state of overwhelm? State of overwhelm. So that's a free state. What about you, Patricia? What's your default? get focused <laughs> and take it on take the challenge and take it on and amanda you can write really it sorry, i missed the question but if you can repeat the question yeah what's your default pattern to dealing with a trigger a fear is it um, is it avoidance or running away is it flight is it fight I'm, I'm gonna fight this i'm gonna overcome this i'll do whatever it takes or do you find yourself overwhelmed by it? Um, I would say partly overwhelmed and partly fight. A bit of both there. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. And and we all have a tendency ba based on our habitual pattern, our history with, you know, with our fears, with our triggers. We all do. We just have to recognize, you know, what what is it that we default to? That's number one. Now, every state has a consequence, physiological, psychological, and even emotional consequences. Now, a lot of us tend to theater between fight or flight. And when we under that constant state, we can all really elevate ourselves to freeze. Now, when we are in a state or fight, you know, we, we, we tend to use certain emotions like anger, irritation, resentment, our blood pressure will tend to go up. We will tend to constrict, you know, heart rate will elevate, breath will be constricted, and, and will assume tension. I call it armory. Now, when we tend to default into a flight mode, this is where we use a, what I call control mechanisms. And control mechanisms can be, you know, uh, 
running away, running to the gym, <laughs> running around a track all day long, or workaholism, or escaping into uh, numbing TV, video games. A lot of our addictive behaviors can be formed there. They just give us a full sense of control. Uh, and then when that state becomes chronic and more stressors come in, continue to arouse us, we can move to a free state. Uh, and that could be also suddenly an accident happening on top of it, of what you're going, going through already, or a loss of a friend, or a loss of a job, a loss of a relationship can tip us over that edge and can really put us in an overwhelmed state. Or just that cumulative life stress events. You know, we can only take so much, no, ma no matter how strong we are, we can only take so much. And I've worked with some really strong people and at some point we can move to freeze. And this is where we feel hopeless or helpless, we want to isolate, uh, negative thoughts come in, they consume us, we are consumed by worry and anxiety, and we start to conserve energy. We start to move to that place of, uh, I will conserve this limited amount of energy that I have, so I'd rather not see people, I'd rather stay home. I'd rather minimize my social activities uh, and that could be quite a very dark place for some people and the danger is that with time uh, yeah person feels quite helpless and even quite hopeless and that's a lot of people these days i mean all you have to see is just look around you and, and what's going on in your lives in your neighborhoods uh in in our country here so there's a lot of people in that state of just feeling they can't do very much. It's accentuated also in societies that are very insular in nature. And ca Canadian society is quite insular. So meaning my space is my space. You know, we are very polite. We don't want to bother our family members, we don't want to bother our friends, we don't want to bother our neighbors. So that creates conditions for isolation. And that's a very dangerous place to be when you are consumed and overwhelmed by fear and anxiety. So oftentimes, we, we want to come back. We want to come back to that harmonious state that nice balance state in our nervous system and our heart coherence, where we feel connected to ourselves, we feel connected to people around us, to nature, uh, and we feel grounded and balanced. We all want that, but we just don't have enough tools. We don't have enough tools initially when those triggers occur, and we don't have those tools also to build resilience to our triggers. So our triggers or our fears become our enemies. They are repressed. They are repressed deep, deep inside and they're managed. And they can show up in all kinds of ways, very tricky ways sometimes. They infiltrate our mind and they hijack us and keep us in, in past events and possible future threats. And really fear uh, when we are consumed by it or anxiety is like a hallucination. Biochemically, it does create hormones in the brain that, that, that distort our perception, our perception of reality of what is. And we are totally disconnected from our intuition, our knowing. And we lose resilience and this is where we sink we get overwhelmed and and the nervous system is so sophisticated it's it's managing it for you but eventually even the strongest nervous system get overwhelmed and uh, and again your physical symptoms in a way are the evidence of fear 
and they, they sustain also chronic conditions, chronic pain, chronic diseases. A big part of it is fear. And that's what I discovered for myself. Luckily, at, a, at an early age, initially traumatized by an accident that nobody could fix. And as time went on and I experienced pain, anxiety came in, depression came in, other symptoms came in, and I was overwhelmed by it as a young man. And nothing was helping. I did the whole rounds that went to the doctors and the specialists and the, the rehab facilities, and which made it worse because there I thought my problem would be fixed. My, my problem wasn't fixed. And then I went on my own and tried the chiropractic and and the, and the acupuncture and the massage therapy. And everybody brought their own take on my pain, but my pain did not go away. And luckily, you know, uh, through divine intervention, I was forced to see the roots of my pain. And the subconscious at one point, after a year of struggling with my pain, revealed the roots to this pain that wasn't going away. And it was a back injury. It was a severe back injury. And once I saw the roots to my pain, the, and the, in nature were emotional, and memories and experiences repressed, uh, it was like opening... It was like opening a dark hole that I wasn't ready to see or re ready to deal with, but I had to because it was like turning, turning on lights in very dark rooms and I couldn't ignore it anymore. So the awareness of what I call the, the illumination was forced upon me at a young age. And, and luckily I was guided to the right therapist who helped me understand what I was going through and why I was suffering. And one of the first things uh, he recommended that I took to right away, him being also a practicing Buddhist, he said, if you want to change your pain, you must, you must change the state that you're operating under. And once you change that state, your pain and your traumas will start to change. I said, well, that sounds simple. <laughs> How do I do it? And he goes, well, meditation is a practice that enables you to start to see your pain and to break it down. And I took his advice and being the young man that I was at the time, I signed myself into a 10 day silent retreat out of all things, which was tremendously courageous for a 20, 22 year old at that time. But in that retreat, being silent with my pain and with my body and with my mind, I started to experience, you know, the, the, the makings of my pain, the components of my pain. And a bit and a huge factor of my pain were the emotions that I wasn't dealing with. And a biggest factor was fear. Fear anger, resentment, and my avoidance of it. And the more I avoided the looking at those feelings in that silent retreat, the more I saw my pain increase. And as I just learned to be with my pain and, and, and understand the inner workings of my pain and accept it, my pain level started to decrease. So as I experienced that in the first three days, I learned now with practice and with resilience, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, my pain completely disappeared. Wow. And was replaced. And it was at a moment where I was fully sweating, broke into a sweat, dying, <laughs> trying to be with my pain. I mean really just about to scream with agony and and i was like just be with it see it for what it is and then it disappeared it dissolved and i was replaced with love 
I was replaced with what I call healing. And I was astounded by the experience. I was perplexed. How could this happen? How can I go from one extreme to another? But the experience gave me the validation and, and the confidence that this pain is not permanent. This pain is not permanent and, and I can heal it. And when I came out of that 10 day silent retreat, I dedicated the next few years into a strong practice of meditation and, and continue working with this therapist. And that was the platform of me becoming a therapist and, and age 26. And based on that experience, based on, on what I learned in that silent retreats and and the workings of, of the mind and the body, how amazing it can be and how we have full control over it if we just choose to be without pain, to be without fear, and not to have an aversion to it, not to hide our fears, hide the emotions, and start to gather more tools to work with them. And, and sometimes that's all we need, our tools. One of the first things I learned in that retreat, the, the importance of our breath. The importance of our breath and i'm going to take you through a tool that i give to all of my clients and and, and what i found now working 20 years uh, with with complex pain and the effects of trauma the simpler the tools uh, the more effective they are and the genius is always in the simplicity all the tools that I've come across that were given to me from my clients, just working with the clients that I have and, and came through spirit, came through my exploration. All the tools that work are quite simple. So this is a very simple tool and it works, especially when anxiety starts to take you right away. When anxiety comes in, anxiety is just a lower level of fear. It's really a, a branch of a fear. Uh, and then an anxi anxiety uh, can be quite suffocating, you know, and, and then before you know it, you're consumed by it. And it can move into a panic attack very quickly. So this tool in five minutes reverses that cycle. Okay. Now the lights are going. <laughs> This is going to be quite a thing. <laughs> now it's like Halloween. Yes. There we go. You can still see me? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'll take you through this tool, okay? And I call it cooling the circuit. These are the circuits that are consumed by fear, anxiety, stress. And a lot of us exist from here to here. And this is where what feels so overwhelming. And this is where what tires us, all that overstimulation, overactivity, being caught in the mind. And, and the circuits really can get quite hot and quite stressful. And what really happens Physiologically, the blood drains to your limbic brain. And that's, that's the part of our brain that really controls us when it comes to our habitual patterns and our fears. So when a trigger comes in, right away, we, we start to operate from that limbic brain. And, and, and we start to do things that later we think, why did I do that? Things that don't make sense. Why did I respond this way? That wasn't good for me. I should know better. I mean, when, when, you, when you're speaking to yourself that way, it's not really you that is responding that way. It's that part of your brain. And it's very primitive and it's very strong. And this is where the blood tends to drain. And that's what creates a lot of our stress. And again, that chronic patterns. So this method just reverses the blood flow 
moves it from our limbic brain to our frontal cortex. And if you do it for five minutes, and, and we're going to experience it today, you will achieve it just in five minutes. And sometimes if you, again, experiencing a panic attack, it might take a little bit longer, but in five minutes, there's already an effect. Okay? So please join me and, and we'll do it together. And I'll take time and you let me know how you feel. So just sit back comfortably. And the, and the method is again, quite simple. We're gonna breathe through our nose deep to the back of the brain. And as you breathe out, imagine that you have a straw in front of you and you're gonna gently blow through the straw and you're gonna take your time as you're doing it, okay? And that's all we're gonna do for about five minutes. Sounds good? Okay, let's begin. So let's breathe in and out. And in and out. Really purse your lips as if you really have a straw right on your lips and empty out the breath in through the nose and out. Good. In. And really use your visualizing skills. See the breath go to the back of the brain and out through the mouth. As if you're circulating that breath. In. And out. In. And out. In. And out. In. And as you continue to breathe in this way, to just connect with the rest of your body too. In. And out. In. And out. In. And out. In. And out. Take your time breathing out. In. Circle it up breath. And out. In. And out. Yeah, continue just like that. And again, pay attention to the rest of your body as you're doing so. In. And out. 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 And. And out. And out. And 
and uh, and and uh, and and uh, and and uh, and and uh, and and now uh, fully out and don't open your eyes quite yet pay close attention to the body and as you slowly open up your eyes we're gonna do the second part the second part is using our senses to reorient ourselves back into this reality so i call it the five four three two one so as you open your eyes notice five things around your environment count them five things around your environment as you open your eyes once you picked up those five things pick up four sensations that you feel in the body four sensations and once you picked up those four sensations Maybe tune into three feelings that you're experiencing. And as if you picked up those three feelings that you're experiencing, maybe two things that you can hear in your environment. And as if you picked up those two things that you can hear in your environment, choose one good thing to say about yourself. I am courageous. Good. Well, that was five minutes of breathing and maybe a couple minutes of reoriented. How'd that feel for you? Like it's time to close my eyes again. And you crave? I crave going back to where I was a minute ago. Okay, good. What about you, Patricia? Or oh, Amanda? It, it was uh it's nice to practice together i think and there's a, a sense of settling and kind of a few different levels of awareness kind of emerging out of that good good thank you and amanda a sense of calm and um Learning to be able to do that on your own, I guess. Learn to be able to do that on your own. Well, I'll send you a recording just to, you know, remind yourself of that. Yeah. But that's a practice that you can practice. Uh, you can do it a few times throughout your day. Not just when you're triggered. Yes, go ahead, Patricia. I have an anecdote to share. Yes. My daughter my husband gifted us a nice plane ride up above the city of Ottawa in one of those old planes. And my daughter was thrilled sitting in the co-pilot seat and mama had a panic attack in the back. And I was like, this motor is so loud. And so I bet you I should, I should just try to do what I know. And I started imitating the motor noise on the out breath making it as long as I could. And after two minutes, 
<laughs> to settle down. Uh, the pet is really, really powerful. And that, uh, that really taught me a lot. And it's nice to have a motor to <laughs> make sound in front of, at the same time as you do it. So. Yes, fantastic. Good. I think what Patricia said was very interesting that it really makes, that is how much nicer it is to do this in, in a little group. Yes, it is. And it's extraordinary. It focuses the, the focus, it focuses the focus. But uh, now that she's, I, it didn't occur to me during, but when she said it, I thought, well, how true that is. Well, there's something about that group harmony, right? And that, even though it's virtual, uh, we still feel each other's presence with our voice and our energy and it's, it has an harmonizing effect when we do something like this together when we self-regulate we regulate the group too so that's why i love doing this classes and uh, in-person workshops now i'll add a third little tool that works quite effectively especially after the the, the previous two and it's a tool that really releases the sac that surrounds your heart. The sac that surrounds the heart is called the pericardium. And when we experience any kind of distress, fear, anxiety, vulnerability, uh, panic attack, that sac can get quite tight around the heart. And that cuts our breath and creates a whole body response actually. So this third tool, it's a simple tool again, and it works. If you can find the flat bone, the sternum, it's the flat bone right in the center of your chest. And as you palpate it from the top to the bottom, notice if you can find a sensitive area, a sensitive spot in that flat bone. Let me know when you, if you have. And if you haven't, that's okay too. So I found a little sensitive spot right at the bottom for me. Let me know if you have, and if you haven't, that's fine too. This still works. You have Patricia? Good. Amanda? Yeah. Good. And Melanie? I think so. Okay, good. So focus on that spot and bring these three fingers together. Okay. And as you bring the three fingers together, gently tap on it. Very gently. And you just tap back and forth. And as you tap on it, wait until your body responds one of three ways, either a sigh, a yawn, or a smile. And you can tap up and down the bone, the sternum, up and down the flatness of the bone. Well, I can see Melanie and Patricia already responding. <laughs> That's good. So when we uh, elicit one of those three responses, the, the sac, the pericardium that surrounds the heart starts to relax. It's just a natural response. And you can even exaggerate the response. And it's always a yawn, a smile, or what else did I say? A yawn, a smile, a sigh. It's one of those threes, always. And now doing it, how does that feel? It's a nice feeling, but I like the, the other one was more rewarding. <laughs> the breath? Yeah, what we were doing the last time, yeah. Okay, this is just the cherry on the cake. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Yes. So this is a nice sequence 
again, to bring yourself back to that harmonious state, to down-regulate the nervous system. Now, I'll add a couple more. And, and these are points that we use in shiatsu therapy. They are acupuncture points. One of them is right in the midline of the wrist. Patricia will know she's a shiatsu therapist. About two finger widths right from the crest. So measure two fingers. And right between the two tendons in the center, there's a point there that helps, again, that sac that surrounds your heart, the pericardium. And all you have to do is just gently, either with your middle finger or with your thumb, gently hold it. And as you hold it, slowly, slowly press in. And you can use it for about 20, 20 seconds to up to two minutes. And it's a nice self-regulating point. It's a point that we also use for nausea. Often with anxiety, there comes a lot of nausea too. We feel quite nauseous and unwell. Good. That's point one. Point number two is for the heart. So if this was in the middle, we're gonna go just again, follow the crest of the wrist and we're gonna go in line with that pinky finger. And right here, you should feel a depression, a little bit of a depression there. And again, you can place your thumb, hold it and then gently press in, very gently press in. Again, from 20 seconds to up to a few minutes if you need to. And it's really a calming point for the heart. Good. How do those points feel for you, Amanda and Melanie? First time trying them out. Just fine, very relaxing. Good. And Amanda? Yeah, good. Good. Patricia, I know you've pressed those points on many people before. And I don't know if you use it on yourself, but I love these two points, the two of my favorite points. Good, good. Well, you know, in between uh, the breath, the sensory awareness or sensory reintegration and those two points, that's a nice sequence. And the tapping on the chest, it's a beautiful sequence to deal with anxiety, to deal with fear, to deal with stress. And you can do each one on its own, or you can do it as a sequence. But it does help. I've had many patients, even with severe panic attacks, that resort to the sequence, or they choose one of them when it's quite bad, and they're able to reverse their panic attack, just like Patricia did on a plane up high in the sky in those small propeller planes. You know, she so just found a toolkit and brought herself back with a breath. Uh, so that can be done, and and. Uh, we don't only have to do it when we are triggered. Uh, you can do it even as a preventative measure. Just as Amanda said, there's just a, a matter of developing practices, little practices, and they don't take very long. You can do them while you're working, even just taking a five minute break and doing it. You can do it in the morning, you can do it at night before you go to sleep. It's, it's, it's again, habitual practices that start to build more resilience. Now, the last thing I want to share with you is, you know, how do we create a new state? You know, how do we change our habitual patterns? You know, before we go into the details, 
you know, the, the surgeries, we must create a certain frame to it. We must create a, a, a new posture of being. We must create a new container for a new state. And this next sequence is, is touches on one of my principles, which is at some point we have to realign ourselves. We have to realign ourselves physically first to create more ease, more control, more power in this system before we engineer it. We, we must create the structure for it. We must create the architecture for it. So this next sequence will enable us to get up and I'll show you the sequence. So come get up with me. Let's see. So here, we always start with our feet first. The feet are what grounds us to the earth. And if you look at your feet, make sure that they're in line with your arms and your shoulders, almost creating like a, like a nice triangle. And when you look at your feet, imagine that you have a clock in front of your feet and 12 o'clock is right between your feet. And the right foot should be at one and the left foot should be at 11. And once you have your feet set, watch me from the side, we're gonna do a little swing with our feet and create a momentum in our body and watch the momentum go as if a wind is coming through you. And when the momentum ends, just allow yourself to relax. Allow the feet to relax onto the ground and the hips to relax. So let's try that together. So just a little sway once only. Allow that momentum to carry you. And when it finishes, just relax onto your feet. How do you know you're fully relaxed? You should feel your pelvis relax to the back you should feel a slight tilt in the pelvis when you fully relax. If you really want to exaggerate it, clench your glutes and unclench them. That's how it should feel when your, your feet and legs and pelvis and hips are completely relaxed. So let's do that sway again. Follow the movement. And when it naturally wants to end, just relax into the feet. Feel all of your feet, all the little intricate muscles in the feet relax. Feel the hamstrings relax, feel the hips and glutes relax and you should feel that pelvic tilt naturally happen. And when it happens, create traction. As if somebody's lifting you from the tip of your head. And you do it very, very slowly so you can feel the spacing that you're creating between your vertebras and your neck. Slight traction from the crown of the head. Now a slight pull from the coccyx, your tailbone going to the earth. So you should feel also your lower back open up, all the vertebras in your lower back. As your crown goes up to the heavens, the tailbone goes to the earth. And that's a natural traction that you give to your nervous system and your spine so your nerve can relax even more. The next part is to breathe to your vulnerable aspect. All the, asp all the areas that tend to constrict, which is the throat, the jaw, your chest, the area between the heart and the other organs. So bring breath into it, breath and space. So breathe in, creating space in your throat, creating space in your chest, 
lower into the <clears throat> where your solar plexus are and the diaphragm and even lower to the rest of the abdomen all the way down to the area above your sexual organs and as this area starts to soften the last bit is imagine the string being coming out of the heart out of the center of the heart right through the chest and slowly feel that sternum, that breastbone, slowly coming out. Not with a lot of effort. Don't force it to come out, just with ease. As if a string is pulling you right from the heart. And breathe into the heart. I always like to imagine four screen doors being opened up, like the four chambers of the heart those Japanese screen doors, you slide one and you come out a little bit. And you slide another and even more. A third one and more. And the last one and more. And now orient yourself to your space. Just look around, maybe even walk around a bit in this posture and see how it feels. Again, with that string leading you from the heart, as if your heart is leading you around the room. Yeah, let me know how it feels. And when you're ready, you can come back to your seat. How was that your how's that experience for you? Very much like the first thing we did. Very, very similar to that, but it was the whole self. Mm. And what are you experiencing? Well, I mean, that I'm very much in my father's study because that's where I am. I mean, he's dead, but I'm very aware that that's that I'm in his room. Mm. Anything else? Just real quiet. Thank you. Amanda? Um, it's made me feel really sleepy. <laughs> That's good. I don't know if that's normal, but obviously it's relaxed me a lot. So I feel very good. sleepy right now. Good, good. Excellent. Anything else you noticed? Um, How was I've the sequence? Was it simple enough for you to follow? yeah good yeah and you patricia some things are hard to put into words but uh what is easy to put into words is uh i'm less actually fatigued than i was before even though it's way past my bedtime <laughs> so <laughs> and uh yeah thank you now, I, I, I lovingly call this uh, frame or this posture or this realignment empowering the tigress or the tiger. Taking the elements of nature. When it, to me, when a, a tiger or a tigress moves, there's an elegance to it. There's an ease. There's nothing to fear in the jungle for the tiger the tigress when the monkeys try to distract the tigress and throw coconuts on it the tigress doesn't even look up she says silly monkeys throwing coconuts who cares <laughs> you know when the hyenas or the antagonists try to antagonize the tigress all the tigress has to do is look at the one that is antagonizing her and say you're crazy i'm a tigress 
Pythagoras only exerts herself when she plays, mates, and eats. Otherwise, everything is done with ease. And that ease also provides power. In a way, that's what uh, Patricia is feeling, is this innate power that is evoked. You feel relaxed, but also highly aware. And that's the state. To feel completely relaxed in the body and the mind, but your awareness expands. And even uh, your peripheral vision started to expand. Uh, because fear restricts our vision. Just like a zoom camera, it, it would make it closer, like a closed circuit, it will create blind spots. So you'll only be able what fear allows you to see, which is from here to here. And you won't see what? It's in your blind spots. Physically, in, in the physical world, but also in the mind and your perception and when you change the state those blind spots are removed and your peripheral vision extends if you practice this out there in the busy world you will notice this you will notice when you are restricted with anxiety stress or fear and if you just do this little sequence you'll notice that starts to dissipate and, and, and your vision ex extends. And, and it seems like uh, time and space slows down for you. Uh, and it's not that you uh, are slowing down. You can be just as fast, but, but you feel completely relaxed. And when I started to practice this over and over again, uh, I have this ability that when things are falling beside me or around me, I, I can pick it up before it falls <laughs> very quickly. And it's just, a lot of it comes from this practice of, of being in this state as, as much as possible. I mean, of course I regress like every human, but it's how quickly we come back to the state. And that's the key, it's using tools to regulate ourselves and eventually build, again, resilience. So thank you uh, so much for being with me. Thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you, Patricia, for being uh, all the way from Ottawa and your time difference, I appreciate that. I hope the tools will be helpful for you going forward. And if you have any comments or questions before we leave, that'll be great. How often are we going to do this? I'm going to create some more classes. So just uh, stay noticed. Thank you so much, Mihail. We're going to bring this uh, back. I, I did a lot of them during the pandemic. I kind of took a break uh, through the summer and the spring, but now we're going to restart them and do some more classes online and in person. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mihail. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Bye, ladies. Good night. Bye, bye. 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 bye.